of the receiver. Immediately afterwards, I recognized the voice that had answered in German. It was that of Captain Richard Madden. Madden's presence in Victor Runeberg's flat meant that the end of our efforts, and though this seemed to me quite secondary, or it should have seemed, our lives as well. It meant that Runeberg had been arrested or murdered. Before the sun set on that day, I would face the same fate. Madden was implacable, or rather, he was obliged to be implacable. An Irishman at the orders of the English, a man accused of a certain lack of zealousness, perhaps even treason, how could he fail to embrace and give thanks for this miraculous favor, the discovery, capture, perhaps death, of two agents of the German Empire. I went upstairs to my room. Absurdly, I locked the door, and then I threw myself on my back onto my narrow iron bed. Outside the window were the usual rooftops and overcast six o'clock sun. I found it incredible that this day, lacking all omens and premonitions, should be the day of my implacable death. Despite my deceased father, despite my having been a child in a symmetrical garden in High Feng, was I now about to die. Then I reflected that all things happen to oneself, and happen precisely, precisely now. Century follows century, yet events occur only in the present. Countless men in the air, on the land and sea, yet everything that truly happens, happens to me. The almost unbearable memory of Madden's horsey face demolished those mental ravelings. In the midst of my hatred and my terror, now I don't mind talking about terror now that I have foiled Richard Madden, now that my neck hungers for the noose, it occurred to me that the brawling and undoubtedly happy warrior did not suspect that I possessed the secret, the name of the exact location of the new British artillery park on the anchor. A bird furrowed in the gray sky, and I blindly translated it into an aeroplane, and that aeroplane into many in the French sky, annihilating the artillery park with vertical bombs. If only my throat before a bullet crushed it, could cry out that name so that it might be heard in Germany. But my human voice was so terribly inadequate. How was I to make it reach the leader's ear? The ear of that sick and hateful man who knew nothing of Runeberg and me, save that we were in St Stratfordshire. Staffordshire? <laughs> and who was vainly awaiting word from us in his arid office in Berlin pouring infinitely through the newspapers. I must flee, I said aloud. I sat up noiselessly, in need but perfect silence, needless but perfect silence, as though Madden were already just outside my door.